So today I want to preach from an interesting passage uh, in the book of Exodus. I don't think I've preached from this passage before. I don't know, maybe I have, but I don't remember doing that. And uh, it's a story about mothers, midwives. And so I've titled my message today, Mothers and Midwives. Mothers and Midwives. And uh, at the end of the message, you determine which of these roles you are playing in life, whether you're playing uh, both roles in life or one of them in your life. And the passage is in Exodus chapter 1 and from verses 15 to 21. Exodus chapter 1, 15 to 21. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom the name was Shipra, and the name of the other poor. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the bed stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Amen. This passage talks about mothers because it talks about Hebrew women uh, who are giving birth. And then it talks about the people who help them to give birth. Uh, a mother is a person who gives birth or a person who brings forth, a person who produces another human being. And at this time in the life of Israel, they are in Egypt. And the number of the people is multiplying. They are becoming a great nation. And Egypt is scared of them because they, they, they are not sure what the Israelites will do, that maybe one day they will become an army and fight Egypt. So the Pharaoh, who thought he was smart, decided that the only people who can fight in the army are the men. So ensure that they don't come into this world. When you see a child being born, uh, kill uh, them if they are males. And he addressed this challenge to the midwives. So who is a midwife? You know that already. A midwife is one who helps mothers to bring forth. A mother brings forth, but many times they need help to bring forth. And a midwife is another woman who is not bringing forth, but who helps the one who is bringing forth to bring forth safely. The Hebrew word that is used for midwife is a very interesting one. It means one who brings forth. One who brings forth, basically. So if, if you look at the Hebrew meaning of a midwife, it's very similar to the meaning of a mother. A mother is one who brings forth, and midwife is also one who brings forth. Of course, we know that a midwife doesn't bring forth by herself, but helps another to bring forth. But the process, what the midwife does, is very similar to what the mother is doing. Both of them are bringing a child into this world. One as a mother and one as the helper of the mother. And without both of them, the child's life is in danger. There are people who are mothers. And there are people who are midwives. They help mothers to bring forth and to take care of their children. And Pharaoh addressed his challenge to this group, to the midwives. And they are the ones he gave the child the charge to. And I want you to note something about the passage that it mentions the name of the women. 
It says one is shipra, the other is poor. You know, the passage could easily have said, and certain midwives. But the Bible mentions their name. And any time the Bible takes time to mention somebody's name, it means that they deserve special recognition. Because there are many people whose name are not mentioned in the Bible. A certain man, a certain woman, a certain this. But this is not just a certain person. These are people who are mentioned by name. In other words, something they did caught God's attention. And God says, if I'm going to record their deed, I want history to remember them by name. And I don't know those two women, but I know their names, Shipra and Pua. They are important to God. There are times we do things and God sees what we do are so important that he records our name. And may the Lord record your name. And may he record your good works. Now, Pharaoh set out a rule, a charge, a command. I want you to understand, Pharaoh was an absolute monarch. He was not a president like our president who needs parliament to approve of his legislation. Pharaoh is absolute. If he says, this is what is happening, that is what happens. He doesn't need parliament, doesn't need Supreme Court, doesn't need a vote. So his word is the rule. His word is the law. His word determines behavior. If he says something should happen, that's what happens. Now I want you to pay attention to how the Bible describes the rule. Verse 16, it says, when you do the duties of a midwife, and I've underlined that phrase, when you do the duties of a midwife, for the Hebrews women, and see them on the bed stools. If it is a son, then you shall kill him. But I want you to pay attention. He says, when you do the duties of a midwife, kill. But the duty of a midwife is not to kill. The duty of a midwife is to give life. The midwife is usually the one who sees the child born before the mother. The mother carries the child, but the midwife sees the child first. And actually, the midwife is the one who is going to say, it's a boy or it's a girl. They announce that to the mother. That is their duty. They are supposed to be carriers of good news. Givers of life. But Pharaoh says, when you are doing your duty, which is supposed to be a life-giving duty, Kill the boys. So what is Pharaoh doing? Pharaoh is perverting the roles of the midwife. Instead of being a protector, he's telling the midwives, be a destroyer. Use your role to destroy life. Instead of life, you must give death. Use your position wrongly. He wanted them to take what is designed to be good and let it become an instrument of evil. And he says you do it whilst you are playing your role. It's a very wicked, devilish, insidious command. That when you are doing what we trust you to do what you have the power to do, what you have the privilege to do, pervert it. Use it wrongly. What a charge. What a command. Now remember that the children that these midwives were supposed to kill were not their own children. They were children belonging to other women. And so we see how easy sometimes it is to take a position of privilege and use it for destruction. Women start life as children. They become sisters, friends. They become wives, mothers, aunts, in-laws, grandmothers. 
And in the process, women also become midwives. They become like these Hebrew women who are given places of responsibility and are supposed to use that place for life. But there is a culture that is going to say, use that same position for destruction. Soon enough, every woman will discover the power they have. Every woman discovers it. Every woman discovers it. You start as a woman, you're young, five years, six years. By the time you hit your adult age and your body starts changing, beauty starts manifesting, you realize that you have power. And more than anything else, you realize you have power over men. Women realize that. They're beautiful, they're attractive, they're beautiful to behold. People look at you till they fall into gutters. <laughs> I follow you wherever you go. Can you imagine, I'm not a woman, but I can imagine the power to know that when you enter a room, the men are going, oh. <laughs> Some of them are your father's age, they're going, oh. And you are conscious of the power. What are you going to use that power for? Now, why did God make you attractive if you're a woman? Why did God give you such a feature that a man has to focus his attention on you. Look at you, desire you, come to you, talk to you, seek for you. Why do you think you have all that power? God gave you that power so that you can attract one man in your existence in this life. One man who will look at you, be attracted to you, come to you, stick with you, be your husband, be the father of your children. That is the beginning and end of that power. But you can also use that power to deny another woman of her husband. You can use that power to make a man leave his wife and children Abandon them, kill the children, destroy the future of his children for you. That is what Pharaoh is telling the women, the midwives to do. The power you have to bring life, pervert it to destroy life. And unfortunately, a lot of women are like midwives who have abused their position of trust. You may not have directly killed a child, you have brought heartache, pain, madness, depression to another woman. Heartache to children. Psalms education destroyed. You are like that midwife. You have the power of life. But Pharaoh says, misuse it. And Pharaoh is a system of this world that perverts the purposes of God. Of course, the men are going to say, thank you, pastor. <laughs> but there are men too who are like that. Your day will come. You are a man. You are a father figure. You're supposed to help a young girl get her first job. You're supposed to help her discover life confidence but you say unless you sleep with her she's not going to get a job what kind of a father does that i'm watching the hands that are clapping so what am i saying pharaoh says you're a midwife this woman trusts you. In her moment of vulnerability, she allows you into her space. You see her nakedness. You see her vulnerable. You see her between life and death. You are the only one in the room. You are the only one she trusts. 
But once she delivers a child, kill the child. I wonder how many midwives have been perverted by Pharaoh. Sometimes people say women are their worst enemies. I don't like that phrase, but sometimes it appears so. Because you are the ones who break other women's families and lives. You are the ones who make some fathers not take care of their responsibilities at home. You are the ones making some woman cry in bed all through the night because her husband is not home. You are the midwife. You're supposed to bring life, but you're bringing death. How did these midwives respond to Pharaoh's rule? They had a code of conduct. In verse 17, the Bible says that the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. That is what I consider the midwife's code. First, fear God. Fear God. They submitted to God's agenda. They fear God. Because once you fix your hearts on God, everything else falls in the right place. Fear God. And I want every woman to adopt this code. Fear God. Fear God. I know you also need money to take care of yourself. You have bills to pay. And you have no help or whatever you think. But you have hands, don't you? You have a brain, don't you? You can get a job. You can get a job. You can train yourself. You can earn an income. Why do you think that your prosperity must cost a family? Fear God. And the reason why the Bible says fear God is because God, God, God is God. Whatever you sow, you will reap. So fear him. In your youth, you may seem like it. Everything revolves around you. But as you grow older and your past investments start paying back, then you say, what have I done? What have I done in this world? What have I done? You've forgotten what you've done. So he says, fear God, because God doesn't forget. That's what the women said. They said, the pastor said, they fear God. So they didn't do the word of the Pharaoh. Resist evil. Resist the temptation. Resist the impulse. Resist the pressure. Whatever you feel, resist it. Resist it. Resist it. You, you may feel it. You may feel even justified. It's amazing how women sometimes feel justified taking another person's husband. His, his wife doesn't make him happy. You know when people say, you wonder, are, are you thinking? Resist evil. Fear God and resist evil. Number three. Protect life. This is what I call the midwife's code. Fear God. Resist evil. Protect lives. That's what we men said. We're going to fear God. We don't fear you, Pharaoh. We don't fear you. We may not have children, but we'll not kill somebody's children. We may not have husband, but we're not going to destroy somebody's home. We don't have it. But we're not going to deny other people from having it. So what was their reward? What did God do for them? Therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. So it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. God is a rewarder. Rewarded them in two ways. First is divine favor. Everybody say divine favor. The pastor says God dealt well with them. God singled them out for special attention. That's why their names are in the Bible. Pastors could have said a certain woman, a certain wife, a certain whatever. But God honored them by putting their names in the Bible. So that thousands of years after them, 
here at Teshi, a place they never even knew in their lifetime existed, a time frame they couldn't imagine. Somebody is talking about Shipra and Pua because God dealt well with them. God remembered them. And God wants you to know if you do right, he will record your name. He will favor you. Your name will never be forgotten. And not only did God give them favor, but God also established them. I like how the Bible puts it. And the Lord did households for them. God gave them households. Why did God give them household? Because they kept other people's households. God gave them their own household. So the impression you get is that at the time they were doing this, they were not married and they didn't have children. Because the Bible says because they feared God, because they acted right, God gave them households. God gave them husbands. God gave them their own children. And God gave them a generation. They became households. You know, normally in Israel, the household is headed by a man. But in these women's cases, they became the households. They became the head of the households. In other words, they became matriarchs of a whole generation. And wherever their descendants are today, may the Lord remember them and do them well. God is able to give you a household. He's able to give you what is your own. He's able to give you your own children, your own home, your own income, your own house, your own property. That's what we learn. You don't need to steal it from somebody. And for every woman in this house, I want you to take that code and say, I'm going to fear God. I'm going to resist evil. I'm going to protect life. And I'm going to protect what doesn't belong to me. And I charge every woman here to take that code. Maybe you say, well, I'm not going after other women's uh, husbands, but protect other women's careers. If you're a woman boss and there's another woman working in your place of work, treat them well. Be kind, be nice to them, be a mother, be a mentor, be a matriarch. Don't be a pharaoh. Protect other women's marriages. Protect other women's children. Child is not yours, but protect that child. And that, I believe, is a code God wants all women to live by. And if you do that, he will remember you. He will favor you. And he will provide your own household for you. Amen. Before we close, I just want to pray for every woman here. Every woman here. Women, stand up. I want to pray with you. Women go through things that men have no idea of. And men go through that women have no idea of. You go through harassment, you go through pain, you go through rejection, you go through all kinds of things. Some of you have had some midwives take your husbands from you, destroy your marriage, destroy your home. But I pray the God of restoration will restore to you. Whatever the enemy stole from you, may God restore to you. Some of you are desiring, you say, Lord, when, when will you establish me? When would you also give me mine? May the Lord give you yours. And I pray on this day, the blessing of God will favor you and find you. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Father, I lift up every woman in this house into your hands. You know, their private pain and their struggle and their prayer and the cry of their heart, the cry for themselves, the cry for their children, the cry for their homes, the cry for their families, the desires that they've brought before you concerning all of these things. Today, Father, I stand with them in agreement and we present every need in this auditorium from a woman into your hands. 
We lift up every prayer. We lift up every cry. We lift up every desire. We lift up every hope. We lift up every pain. We lift up every disappointment. We lift up every hurt. We lift up everything, Lord, in the heart of your daughters this morning into your hands. You are a God of faithfulness. You are the God who establishes households. You are the God who establishes purposes. You are the God who makes all things right for your children. So for every prayer of every woman crying this morning, for themselves, for their husbands, for their children, for their grandchildren, for their sons-in-law, for their daughters-in-law, wherever the prayer is, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that heaven will open over them. And beginning from today, and throughout this week, let them begin a process of a turnaround, a process of a turnaround. For those desiring children, you are the giver of children. Against every expectation, even when they have given up hope, even when they say, we don't think it will happen, let it happen, Lord. Let it happen, Lord. Let there be pregnancies in this house. Let there be pregnancies in this house. Let there be pregnancies in this house. Let the pregnancies be protected and the children be born. For those who have been widowed, those who have been divorced, and those who are going through life desiring, Lord, for a new relationship, may you provide new relationships for them. And I pray, Father, for every woman that you will do something in their life this week that will cause them to laugh and will cause them to rejoice and will call them, cause them to be exceedingly glad. In Jesus' name, amen. God will do it for you. I said, God will do it for you. I said, God will do it for you. We serve a faithful God. He will do it for you. You will see it. You will be glad. You will rejoice. And you will know without any shadow of doubt that God is a God of faithfulness. God bless you, women. Thank you for listening to Living Word. To interact with Pastor Mensah Otebill, like his page on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter at Mensah Otebill. Email Otterville at centralgospel.com or call plus 233-302-688-000.